Perfect. So the purpose of this session should be really practical and good to stick around for. It's all about how to reach out to investors, especially if you're reaching out cold and you're looking to build a pipeline of angel investors or potentially early stage VCs to get the ball rolling with your fundraise. So we are going to be joined by Roxanne, who is an angel investor, also works as well. So Rox, do you want to take yourself off mute and just do a quick introduction to yourself and then we'll get started with the session. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so by day, I head up the strategy at a small hedge fund called GCO. My background has been uh, banking and fintech. Um, I was also one of the first employee in a, in a fintech startup a few years ago. Um, on the side of that, I um, do some angel investing as part of Alma Angels. Um, so Alma is a community um, that tries to support female founders. Um, and I say community because um, it's a not-for-profit. We um, join really um, to kind of help each other out with due diligence, um, but we don't invest as a syndicate. We just try to group to help each other out with um, anything we can. Perfect. So for the founders, session is going to run the same as always. So um, if you've got any specific questions you want to ask directly, you can raise your hand. You can also use the chat. We'll probably spend about 15 minutes or so just going through some top tips for outreach. And then we'll go into some live pitching. So if you would like to pitch Rocks Live, you absolutely can do. And we will let you know when we're at that point. So you can raise your hand for that. So to get started. We'd love to hear from you, and obviously this would just be your personal experience, a bit about what you think is the best way to build a pipeline of investors, what approach you should use if you're a founder and you just haven't got a network yourself to start with. Yeah, so I think the first step is really go deep into research. Um, so look at... Um, kind of look at the ecosystem in general, look at the type of investors that you want to approach. So if it's your first fundraise, um, you're going to want to go for angels, which are kind of for your first, um, let's say, supporters um, for the business. So they are really going to invest on you based on um, the team, based on the idea and the vision. Um, typically, um, most angels can invest uh, pre-MVP as well. Um, so really, it's about the vision then um, I, I don't know exactly what other sessions you've had, but obviously as you grow, you will go for uh, bigger, more institutionalized investors so the venture capital funds um, or some family offices. But the first thing to do is really um, research. So one thing that I always say is that um, anyone can potentially be an, an angel investor. Um, so if you're um, in a particular sector, um, let's say you're, I don't know, around pharma, or biotech, like women's health, um, look at the bigger pharma companies, look at who are the big directors in these companies. So potentially people who have a bit of money that they can invest on the side and try reaching out to these people with your idea. Um, it can also work that in certain situations, these people might not become investors, but they might become customers actually. So, you know, like, try to to join your join your research that way and then out of your research don't just reach out to everyone at once um try to categorize your investors into um i would say tier one the people that you really really want to have on your cap table they would be super useful they would be um they would really represent well um your company then have a tier two, which are um, people that would be great to have. Um, they are kind of not like necessarily your ideal, but then they're next in line. And then tier three is kind of, okay, like who else can I reach out to? And try to work your way through, not to overwhelm yourself from the beginning. Um, one thing that's really important is that you should really try to keep track of all the interactions that you're having with investors, everyone that you're meeting, um, write down their feedback, write down things like, oh, they said they want to keep in touch or um, maybe I'm too early stage for them. So it might be worth reaching out in a year or in two years. Um, and what I've found that some founders have done really well um, is to kind of keep 
um, a sort of newsletter that they use for their investor outreach. Um, so um, I'm on a few of these um, newsletters where they give you um, really some key metrics, how the business is doing. And it doesn't have to be something very often, you know, you could do it just maybe every six months, but kind of try to trigger your um, these people that you've contacted in the past. And actually, it might be that if they are not the right people to invest at that point, they might know someone who might be interested. So you you never know um, where these things can can take you. But I would say like definitely try to keep in touch with with how many as many as you can. Um, that's like a few of my of my top tips on this already. I don't know if you have a yes. following question on that. Yeah, sure. So I guess you identify people like you said that are. Um, maybe more senior in the industry that you're in and ask them to invest. So yeah. you've got an opportunity to do that via LinkedIn, or you could try and find people's email addresses. If you're kind of, you've got an option to go warm or cold, would you just say always go warm if you can and try and ask for an introduction to someone that you're mutually connected with? I would say yes. Um, the reason is that we're all human beings. We're all very busy in our lives. And so if you obviously have someone that you know that reaches out to you and that tells you about someone, it's always easier. Now, that doesn't mean that cold outreach doesn't work. Um, in general, I prefer LinkedIn because I find it a bit less intrusive than someone who like kind of dug up my email and if that makes sense. But um, yeah, I obviously we, we don't all have, you know, extensive networks from the start. So, um, you know, try with, going to events first, um, try using the people that are around you, try using other founders as well, uh, because, you know, if they've, if they've gone through that process themselves and they might have some someone who wasn't right for their business, but could be right for yours. So really help each other out, um, help each other out by, introdu by introductions, I would say, like always, always try to ask. Um, also, one thing around Angel is that obviously, you can reach out to all sorts of syndicates or all sorts of communities. Um, really make, make use of that, make use of, um, uh, you know, any sort of like networking events that they put together sometimes for between founders and angels, um, or um, if you are at the later stage, uh, make use of the office hours of that VCs have, especially now uh, many more VCs are doing female founders office hours. So just, um, Try to, you know, every time you catch one and it's not easy to keep in touch with all these events that are happening all the time. But if you happen to see one, just, you know, pass it along to to the rest of the your community of founders. Um, that, that definitely helps. Yeah, I'm just going to add um, a kind of tip slash ask because we get asked to make introductions quite a lot. And I'm, I'm sure you do as well. And all other angel investors get asked for intros to any other angel that might be interested. Yeah. Linking back to your first point. Um, if you're going to ask someone to make an intro for you, just make it as easy for them as possible. So we get people saying, can you introduce me to every investor that you know, <laughs> with pretty much any context? Or can you reach out to these 10? And we already know that they're not relevant for that industry. So then yeah. we'll always go back and say, well, why do you want an intro to this person? And if the founder hasn't done any research, then we're like less likely to make that introduction. So if you yeah. say, actually, it's only these two investors that I want an introduction to. And the reason is because of this. And here's my deck. And here's a one pager. And here's some key stats. Then that, that's better for us because we don't want to burn our bridges with investors either. So we want to make sure that we're recommending people that are actually the right fit for their investment criteria. So keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah that's great feedback. And actually, even when you're um, doing any sort of cold reach outs on, on LinkedIn or whatever, um, keep it very like short and concise. Make sure that you have some sort of like just one liner about the business um, and make sure that it's very easy for the person to um, quickly understand to categorize you into a sector because that's how investors will think eventually even if you think of your business as something completely disruptive and that is you know outside of the sector still try to make it sound like recognizable for the investor because um you know, we, we all have our sort of investment thesis that we're looking at. And so the easier you make it for us, the, the better. Um, I would say for angels, um, 
you don't necessarily need to attach the deck straight away. Um, if the person wants it, they will ask for it um, when they answer. Um, if you're reaching out to a VC, um, add uh, a one pager or a short deck. Uh, you don't need to say too much. You don't need to add the financials or things like that. Like So I would always have kind of two versions of your deck, one that you present or that you'll send to people where you know like you've already spoken to them and one version that's a shortened version um, that just gives them a rough idea of the, the vision and who you are so that they can make a very quick call. Yeah, so something else you just kind of mentioned about being succinct, but if someone was reaching out to you cold on LinkedIn, would you want to see in that message like any other investors that are on board or some something about traction or numbers? Like what would someone say that you're like, wow, okay, I want to follow up with you? Um, yeah, I guess if there is anything that really like stands out of as in, you know, over the past year, we've had like 600% growth. I don't know, like if there's something that really stands out. Um, the So the first thing that I look at is really, I, first of all, I look at if it's a female founder, because for me, that's that's what's important. Then I look at if um, if it's a sector that I, I know I can help with, because, um, you know, I was mentioning biotech before, that's, that's probably not one for me. Um, but um, if, if you're around fintech or wealth tech or, or women's health, then I'll, I'll, I'll be, it'll be easier for me to, to help. Um, but I don't necessarily need the deck straight away. But if I have sort of like, yeah, like a, a thing that will grasp my, my attention. But for me, to be honest, like just knowing that it's within my sector, I will probably come back to you and, and ask, ask some questions before we go on to a call or anything. So um, even if you don't put it in that first message, I, I think if the person thinks that there is an interest, then they will, you know, um, they will come back to you after. Um, or what you can do as well is if the person hasn't straight away answered, you might want to keep that, the, the sort of key fact for, for a chaser. Um, and on, on chasers, um, I don't think there is a wrong way of doing it. Um, I think don't be shy about chasing, like don't chase a hundred times, but don't be shy about chasing two, three times because, you know, again, um, investors can be busy people. Like um, angels most of the time do that on the side of a job. So it's not always easy to um, juggle with everything. Um, so it might be that the person just missed it or when they read it, it was the wrong moment. So um, yeah, go for it, just chase. And I would say the same by emails. If if an investor hasn't given you feedback after a few days and you've already done a first call, like go for it. Just, just you know, trigger their memory again and, and remind them that, that you're there waiting for, for something. Yeah, I know based on a previous conversation that we had that you like to add value. So you like to invest in businesses that you can add value to. But if you're approaching a bunch of investors Let's say you've got the pick of the bunch and you're not in a situation where you just want to take anybody's money. What kind of questions should you be asking investors as the founder to make sure that you've got the right fit um, with an investor that's actually going to add value to you? Um, so it depends on what that value is. So if that value is, you know, introduction or um, either introduction to investors or to customers, then you just need to make sure that they are within the industry um, that, that you're looking for. Um, and then I would say if it's kind of a, a different type of value, if it's more that you actually want them to be um, active in the business strategy or something like that, um, typically these will be people who have other experiences in other businesses. So try to connect or ask them if they can introduce you to some founders that they've worked with and try to talk to some of these founders. I, we're lucky that in the UK, we have um, obviously Companies House where you can search for someone's name and you can see if they've been, you know, chairman or whatever, or director of another business. So you can kind of find out like that a little bit more about um, the investors. Um, I would say you you don't want to overburden yourself as well with that due diligence. So like if it's an investor that's going to be the lead or that's going to be putting like a really big check in your business, yes, go all in, go talk to founders. If it's someone that's a small check and that, you know. Um, but one thing that's also um, important is to understand how much 
um, how much kind of admin will that investor bring um, in your cap table? So if during the due diligence process, you can already feel that they are very demanding, but in kind of a, a way that's overwhelming and, and that's very different from what you've seen with other investors, you might want to ask yourself, like, how will that feel when they are actually like a part of the business? And, you know, it's, it's like a marriage, and I'm sure you've heard that from others before, that it's really it's a long-term partnership between you and the investor. So if you have someone who is, um, you know, every week is asking you a question or requesting for documents or something like that, um, that might be a bit too cumbersome, um, especially when you are at the very early stage. Oh, um, one thing that's been built at the moment is a platform called Landscape VC. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a platform where founders can um, discuss experiences that they've had with um, investors. Um, I know that, I mean, I would say it's very relevant when you're looking at um, who you're choosing as your VC on your cap table. Um, for angels, it's, it's a bit more tricky because um, some people may have a bad, a bad um, experience with an angel just because maybe they were not reactive enough, or maybe they were just, um, so I would take the the, the, the comments um, with a pinch of salt um, when it's regarding angels, I would say, but when it's regarding like a VC or like an institution, you should definitely look into these kind of reviews. Yeah, uh, there's two questions that have come in from Lauren. Lauren, I know you had your hand up as well. So do you want to ask live? If so, take yourself off mute and feel free to ask. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, hi, so my question is around if you're reaching out to someone on LinkedIn cold that you would love to invest, maybe someone who's worked in a corporate or a previous founder in your sector, um, do you think you should mention your raise and the opportunity or is it better to play like a longer game and ask for advice and try and build a relationship and then maybe mention it a bit later? Um, and then I can ask my second question afterwards. Um, so I would say ahead of the race like before you even need the money try to reach out to these people so um especially now you're part of the you know you're part of the the program um you've already you've started building your businesses um try already reaching out to these people for advice like you were saying um because it's always it's always easier when you are not straight away asking for money but if you are in the process of raising i would say go straight with the the, the raise um and you can also ask, add in your message, say something like um, that you would also be very um, keen to have a chat that just to hear some, some advice. Um, so you kind of dilute it a little bit like that. But um, if, if you're in the process of raising, I would say just, just you know, kind of say it out, right? Um, don't necessarily put your valuation on your message straight away. Uh, unless you have a lead investor, and in that case, you can you mention the lead investor and you can mention the details. Um, but these are um, metrics that may change with the discussions that you have with investors. Um, so it can sometimes put off certain people because they might think like, oh, actually, this is this is outside of what I would normally do, or uh, you know, it, it, it's it's just better to keep that for. Um, a later conversation, but you can say I'm currently raising my pre-seed round and I would appreciate um, your um, feedback and advice on what you're building or something like that. Thanks, that's really helpful, thank you. And my second question is, um, I'd love your advice on like what kind of um, documents uh, like an investor might want to look at? So would you want to look through a financial model or like a detailed forecast? Or is it just more, more backing you and your vision and kind of verbally talking through your milestones that you're hoping to achieve? So it depends on what point you are in your process. Um, for the first introduction call, um, I would keep it um, short and kind of focus on the vision, focus on the team. Why are you the right person to be um, to be bringing this, pro this project to life. Um, and then they will um, definitely ask for to see the financials um, after that. So when you're in that first call, you might want to go into what's your monetization strategy, but you don't necessarily need to go into details around all the uh, forecasts that you've prepared, but it will definitely 
um, be the next step. So just you need to have it ready um, from the beginning when you start the, the raise. Um, on other documents that um, um, investors may ask for, um, I mean, when we are working as a group with Alma, what we like to do is to um, uh, put a document together where we all ask our questions so that the uh, founder don't necessarily need to be on a call with, or, or like on a few different calls with the investors, but has the time to kind of answer um, uh, separately on like just one document that goes to um, the investors that are interested in the, in the group. Um, so you may have some people who ask for that. If you see that certain questions as you're doing these calls that they come back, then it means that it's something that's that's very important for the investors. So either add it to your deck or have a separate document ready that you can call like an FAQ or something like that, where you can add um, more specific due diligence questions that you see are, are like recurring. Um, and when you're preparing for going out to pitch to investors in, in general, it's always a good thing. It's a bit like when you're preparing to go to an interview, um, you have to think of it in advance, what kind of questions would that person ask me? So if you are already putting it on, uh, thinking about it, put it on paper, and then um, you can then, you know, share that if certain investors um, need more information. Um, so I would, I would prepare at least that. Okay. Yeah, that's really big, cool. Thing. I was just going to say it makes a big difference when um, a founder comes back quickly with um, like if it's access to their data room or something like that. The fact that they're organized and prepared actually makes a big difference to how how you come across in our experience. Yeah. Um, when you and when you say the word data room, I know that for a very early stage founder that can feel a bit daunting. But I mean, at your um, at, at your point in time, um, what you should have in that folder is is just very simple things it's your certificate of incorporation it's your financials it's anything around um the tech if your tech business is tech related so what's your tech stack or um is there any uh, patent that you've um already filled or something like that um but don't overthink it and if you see like i said if you see that investors ask for other sort of documents then um, prepare for the next investors and kind of add this to your folder so that you're ready for the next person. Cool. I'm just going to ask uh, two very quick questions, which are a bit more subjective and specific to you. Um, anybody that is interested in pitching, do raise your hand now and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So in your case, you, you mentioned about mentioning the valuation on LinkedIn. If you saw a valuation on a pitch deck, is there ever any evaluation that would make you go, oh, no, I'm completely not interested because it's too low or too high? Or would you always think, OK, it might be negotiable, so I'll take the conversation anyway, because people are really worried about what to put as this number? Yeah, it's um, like I said, unless you have a lead that's been setting that valuation for sure, um, we know that this number may change. Um I will still take the call depending on what the business is um, because, well, first of all, if their valuation is very low, um, and I've only seen that with female founders, by the way, um, I'll want to tell them on the call and be like, are you sure this is what, yeah. and, and I've done that in the past where I've said, are you sure you're only raising 150K? Because I think if you raise like 500, then you can, so um, I'll still do that. And if the valuation is very high, then it's probably a business that's kind of, trending and that has some like pretty big investors um, on board and it doesn't mean that I'll necessarily want to invest because um, probably in that sort of business I might not be able to to really add value um, but um, I'll just find it really interesting for me personally to understand how the business has grown into into that space um, so I, I don't really look at it um, as a hard stop but I'm also not a VC or something like that. Like for a VC, it will be a different conversation. And similar with total addressable market, is there, we've heard before that if if the TAM isn't in the billions, then it looks like it's too low for the founder to be able to get the kind of market share that you need for an investor to make their return. Do you agree with that or do you have any other opinion? 
um, I would um, say um, like go for the highest number, uh, but also something that's realistic. If you're saying like, oh, uh, my business has a, an addressable market market that you know um, seven billion because uh, you know because this is a whole world, then um, it, it's a bit <laughs> obviously pushing it. But um, yeah, always try to oversell on these numbers. Um, and I'll, I'll say that again, but especially as female founders, we always see that we tend to like go lower um, because we want to be more realistic. Um, I would say just, you know, this is the deck and this like very short pitch that you have in the first intro with the investors is your time to shine. It's your time to really sell yourself. So just really go for it. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I would just go for, for big numbers anyway. Perfect. Right. So we're going to go to some live pitches. Rocks for a bit of context. Everyone's going to have kind of two to three minutes. They might yeah. use a deck. They might not use a deck. Depends where they're at. And we just want some really honest feedback from you about whether the problem and the solution statement makes sense, whether it's presented as a big opportunity, whether the narrative um, sells the vision, that kind of thing. So please okay. be as honest as you can be, because um, then it gives everybody an opportunity to make any changes and iterate before we get to our final events. We'll get through as many as we can, um, and we will stop you if you go over three minutes. So Mindy, you're first up. So do you want to take yourself off mute? Great, thank you very much. Um, hello, Roxanne. Thank you so much for making time to do this with us. It's really super appreciated. Um, so I'm um, hopefully I am in the process of sharing my screen. Does it does can any can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Thank you. I'm just gonna put it up. So so my name is Mindy Sawney and I am the founder of Care Stockroom, which is the marketplace for care SMEs to buy better and to do better business. Um, social care is one of those things that is a bit invisible until you need it. But in fact, 15 million adults in the UK need some form of assistance every day to perform those everyday tasks. About a million of those adults receive some form of care at home and about half a million of those adults are in care homes. Uh, the vast majority of um, social care that's provided is provided by families, uh, but of the paid care, it's provided by um, SMEs. And these SMEs are dominated by women. So 85% of senior managers in social care SMEs are women. You would have no idea that that was the case if you went to a care trade show because all you see are men because the women are too busy doing other things. Um, and we really are here to try and fix that by offering them a one stop shop for products, services and advice. So our mission is to save social care SMEs time and money so that they can care more. SMEs are generally paying 30% over the odds in terms of um, against what a larger provider is paying. And they're also spending an inordinate amount of time on the process of um, trying to tender their small amount of business. And if we could help realize those savings, that could mean as many as 22,000 additional care workers into this space. So uh, in, a, in a previous life, I was chair of a small group of um, uh, care homes, regulated care homes, and this was very much my own experience. So I have to search across five different suppliers just to get what I need. Uh, and now I found it, they don't have it in stock. I was constantly, and as I hear my colleagues uh, do the same, constantly questioning, have I, have I got a fair price? I don't really know how to do this tendering business. It's very painful. Um, now I've got this contract, they don't, they're going to tie me in, and um, I know I, uh, and, and now they're putting up the price. But more importantly, I know how to provide really, really good care, but I don't know how to make my business a success. And that's one of the real challenges that the women who lead these businesses face. If you're a seller into the um, social care market, uh, this is uh, very disaggregated on the supply side as well. And sellers um, are, uh, the sector is dominated by wholesalers. Um, and if you're a seller, you are not very satisfied with wholesale performers. So they take a lot of margin if you're a manufacturer. 
Uh, they won't take your whole range. Um, they're not very good at marketing your brand. Uh, but if you are a manufacturer, as indeed half of the sellers on Care Stockroom are, one of the things you really struggle with is how to find customers and service them at a reasonable uh, cost per acquisition. So our solution is for care customers to provide them with the full product assortment in a single place. So they don't have to search across five different uh, providers. Uh, we offer them discount pricing through um, a gated pricing mechanism. Uh, because we have multiple sellers, there's a great deal of stock security. We are in the process of developing a services directory. So all the things that you might need to run your care service, whether that's a solicitor who specializes in dealing with the CQC, which is the social care regulator, uh, or if you need a gardener for your grounds, that we're gonna kind of offer a checker, checker trade just for you, just for social care. But also importantly, to offer you the opportunity to get some advice from your peers and experts. The advice that you might be able to get if you were able to go to a trade show but don't have time to do it. And for sellers, we're giving them the opportunity to aggregate these small customers who do constitute the majority of the market and also to control their price and brand. So the market size um, for business spend just on products alone, just on products, not on services in the UK is 1.76 billion a year. SMEs account for 1.37 billion of that spend. And we're aiming to claim 15% of that market. Um, overall, adult social care is set to double within the next 10 years or so. And uh, globally, it's going to reach um, uh, an uh, accumulated growth of about six or 7%. Uh, we also believe this model has relevance uh, outside social care SMEs. Um, so healthcare, both private healthcare and the part of NHS spend, which is not controlled centrally. Other niche SMEs, which are also dominated by women and also by being highly disaggregated, both demand and supply side. And indeed larger social care providers who are also spending a huge amount of time in procurement processes. Um, and as procurement professionals will tell you, procurement perhaps is dying. Uh, we have um, uh, launched at the end of last year, uh, last year, and we've already achieved significant traction on a very small amount of money. Um, so we have proved the customer proposition. We have well in excess of 2,000 orders, and about half of our ATV uh, comes from repeat business. 70% of our customers are B2B, and that percentage is growing. We have now nearly 50 sellers selling on the site, and half of those are manufacturers. Uh, and include really huge players like Unigloves, who are global manufacturers, but also small UK-based manufacturers. Um, and sellers pay to play with us, and we charge them an annual renewal fee, and those annual renewal fees have been paid. We averaged about 10,000 revenue, uh, 10,000 GMV uh, last year, and this year we're averaging about 20,000. Can I just, I'm just going to interrupt because we've got, um, that you're on about five minutes currently, so can you... I'm I, 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 um, the thing that I would really like a little bit of feedback on is just, um, this is sort of the, the bit that's developing really, which is to say that um, uh, one of the challenges, of course, that we're asked is, you know, what's to stop people doing exactly what you're doing and how are you different? So maybe I'll just do this slide and then I'll stop. Yeah. Um, so there are a few things that are already in place. There are some things that are developing and there are some things that are in our pipeline. So the things that are already in place are that we have the first mover advantage. So we were the first marketplace to launch into this space. And there's now one more. Um, we are default female, unlike um, anybody else playing in this space. We are just about to launch something called the Care Club, which is discounted gated pricing for care providers. We're in the process of developing uh, something called Mindy Pay, which is a, a working title, which is trying to solve the third party pay problem, which is a significant issue in the care sector and will only increase. So it'd be great, particularly with your background, Roxanne, to talk to you a bit about that. Uh, things that are sort of cooking, but not quite underway are things like securing fulfillment deals for our sellers. So being able to aggregate particularly last mile delivery, which will allow us to drive down cost on the site. Uh, also developing cross-site insights. So now that it's much more difficult to track users across multiple sites, um, we're able, because we'll be offering advice and services and uh, products, to really develop a predictive insight for individual customers. 
much like Apple does when you browse Apple News, that's what they then use to determine what they serve you in the App Store. And lastly, we'll be trying to embed our um, store into other people's apps. And we're already in a conversation with a payment card called Clever Card about how we might do that. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Awesome. I'm so sorry. Over. No, no, it's hand straight over to Rox. So do yeah. let us know. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of um, explaining the problem, that was um, really good. Um, and um, your solution as well. Uh, so that slide that you're saying why we're different from the others. Um, if you feel that it's very important, um, because I don't know, maybe it's um, if, there, if you feel that there is other competitors in the market or something like that, maybe you can bring it a bit earlier in your deck. Um, but um, the um, the beginning was um, good. I would say um, it's um, very interesting to see um, the different questions that the um, you know um, carers and sellers are um, the problems that they both have on each side. Um, so I think um, that was quite interesting. Yeah, um, I think you're you're on a good um, track. What I would say is that if you know that you're going to be doing a, a very short pitch, just um, um, shorten it and just make sure that you that you stick to your time because. Um, in, in other situations, the organizers might not be as nice as, as Purdy and, and might actually just like cut you off and then you haven't really said what's the, the most like important in your in your um, deck. Um, and the way that you can do that is, for example, when you're on that size where you have all the, all the questions that each of them are asking themselves, um, don't necessarily go through each of them, just go through like, what are the two biggest ones? Um, and then, um, your um, your audience will um, automatically read the rest while you're on the site anyway. Or if you send your deck afterwards, then they can you know look at it more closely. So just like focus on your main points when you have something that's so short as three minutes. Thank Great. you. Perfect. So Lauren, do you want to go next? Yeah. Thanks so much. Hi Roxanne, um, so I'm going to do a verbal pitch and I'll try and stick to three minutes. Um, so I'm the founder of Oatsu, Overnight Oats, and we help people get the most out of their morning with our plant-based handmade breakfasts. Um, so I've got one of our jars here that we made earlier today. So they're like a ready to eat overnight oat breakfast. So you just open the jar and enjoy it. So just taking the hassle out of mornings and just making it super easy for consumers to enjoy a healthy, convenient breakfast. They might not have time to make their own or they might not know how to prep their own overnight oats. Um, overnight oats is something that become really popular in on Instagram and on TikTok. And they're something that you have to prepare at home, but they're not something that you can currently buy in supermarkets. Um, there are some that are more like birch and mueslis that have dairy in them that are short shelf life in places like Starbucks and prep. Um, but none that you can kind of pick up on your weekly shop um, and have over the course of the week. Um, we make it really easy for you to enjoy our breakfast through the week because we deliver to your door. And we're also going to be available in supermarkets in 2023. And we aim to become the UK's biggest plant-based breakfast brand over the next five years. The UK breakfast market is worth £11.6 billion with 97% of Brits consuming it. And on-the-go breakfasts are back in demand as we return to office um, with the plant-based sector growing significantly and plant-based yogurts growing 5.3% faster than yogurts um, overall. Um, so yeah, we are filling a gap in the fresh breakfast to go category um, and we're catering to shoppers' desires to move away from sugar-laden pre-packaged options and pastries um, and breakfast bars um, and more towards kind of health and fresher breakfasts. And so far we've tested the concept with 1500 customers. So we have an online store, a Shopify online store. We've hand prepared about 13,000 breakfasts for 1500 customers. And we've used their feedback to like, iterate and improve the products and the flavors that people want to see. Um, we've got 1500 email subscribers and more than hundred five-star reviews and a 31% customer retention rate. And then on social media, we've built um, a following combined across platforms of more than 10,000 with about uh, five and a half, 6,000 on Instagram. Um, and then we have demand from retailers as well. So I mentioned the convenience chain. So that's co-op. Um, they've invited us to join our, their incubator scheme to launch next year. And we're also in talks with Holland and Barra about launching into all of their stores as they're bringing chilled food in. 
um, and then also Virgin Atlantic lounges in Heathrow, which we're due to launch into soon, and also speaking to Planet, Aga Planet Organic about launching early next year. Um, we had great success with a rapid grocery delivery retailer called Jiffy, and we were their top selling breakfast product ahead of Kellogg's, Weetabix, and Belvita. Um, we've had great press across newspapers like Metro, The Sun, um, yeah, The Guardian. Um, I also fronted Meta's small business campaign, which included a shout out from BBC Dragon Stephen Bartlett. Um, we're a purpose driven business and we donate a portion of our profits to support young women um, through the Girls Network, which is a charity who give women um, kind of professional mentors from less advantaged backgrounds. And we prioritize sustainability through our packaging choices. So we use glass jars and recycled paper labels. Um, and uh, the team is myself and we're building the team. So I'm bringing on a sales and operations manager um, early next year. And we've got a digital marketing executive. My background is in uh, marketing within the finance industry. And I'm an active member of um, yeah, different communities um, and accelerated programs. Um, we're looking to launch into ambient products. So creating the UK's first overnight oat mix that you can keep in your store cupboard and add milk to, to make your own overnight oats when you're at home or in the office. Um, also add hot water to to make porridge and I'm looking to raise 300,000 pounds I'm thinking at a three million valuation um, based on the contracts that we've got in place with co-op and um, close to finalizing with Holland and Barrett um, and we're going to use that to launch our ambient overnight oat product range next year and also to grow the team um, so yeah that's my pitch I'd really love to know yeah if you've got any feedback about um, anything that you felt was like missing and also about the valuation figure that I mentioned, if you think that's reasonable. Thanks. Um, that was very complete, um, very well structured. Um, I mean, quite um, impressed as well. Um, and I would love to try it for my business, actually, because <laughs> I'm looking for a new breakfast provider, by the way. So I'll check out the website. Um, in terms of the valuation, I'm not um, too shocked, I will say. like. Um, one thing that I want to mention for all of you actually is especially at the moment you're probably hearing that it's more difficult to fundraise or or it might become more difficult um, make sure that when you're calculating how much money you are raising that you're taking into account an 18 month runway um, if people have told you 12 months in the past I think just always aim at 18 because you know things happen um, and um, it's always better to to have more time than less when you want to raise your next round so um, yeah no I think um, um, definitely very well structured um, and um, um, I don't know if you for this round are you already looking at some VC funding or just angels angels we've spoken to some VCs through like the overalls program um, but speaking to other like food and drink founders um a lot of them tend to raise vc funding like later in their journey so i don't know if it would be but early for us okay um what i would say and maybe it's something for everyone as well is um even if you're too early in your journey it's better to hear that from the vc and to start building that connection with them anyway um because for example i mean in the food and bevs um the ones i used to know were jam jar investments um if you've already reached out once um, and they say, oh, too early for me, but they might, they will be connected to angels who are in the food and bev industry, because that's usually what happens if something is interesting for them, but too early, then they will pass it on and vice versa. Um, when something is too late stage for an angel, then they'll introduce some VCs. So start building these relationships already, um, even, even just, um, as you're not really raising from them for this one. Yeah, I definitely will. Thanks so much. Um, I wondered, do you ever look at like investing in food and beverage? Because I know you mentioned different sectors. Um, no, so that's one that's not like, I don't really do consumer businesses um, in general. So um, that's not one, but I can definitely have a think um, because um, other than Jam Jar, I'm sure there are some people. Um, I'll also have um, Perdian MA send you all the link to um, the Alma Angels community so that you can um, reach out to the community and, and send your deck through there. Um, the, in that community, there are definitely people who are interested in, in consumer businesses. So um, you might be able to find some people. Okay, amazing. Thanks so much. 
Great. Uh, next up, we've got Ale. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. That's right. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen um, and um, see if I can present in three minutes. Yeah, I see. Can you see the screen? Yeah, all good. Yeah, but we've got presenter view as well, so we can see your notes. Oh, okay. Um, uh, one second. Um, if I, I will try again. If it doesn't work, I will just go without the presenter view. Can you can you see it now? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so uh, I am Ali. I am the co-founder um, of The Way, which is a um, career platform aiming to disrupt the professional learning, um, professional learning um, and development uh, area. Um, uh, the company companies lose um, an average uh, six hundred five five billion in profit just because um, they don't they don't have a diverse talent pool, right? So. Um, Diverse companies do perform better, and um, the ch uh, chief of staffs, um, talent managers, head of talents, they know this. Um, but they say that their retention L and D that they buy doesn't work uh, because the employees are not motivated to use them. So we know that from them, but we know from users that they're not, they don't want to use them because they're too generic and they don't have, and they lack a personalized approach. So if you already feel like you don't belong. Um, this kind of one size fits all at and D makes it even worse. So what we have is the way it stands for women with epic ideas. Also, it means power in Mandarin is a, a market first career um, champion, basically. Um, and um, the way that this works is um, it, that the idea came from when I was doing um, one on one mentoring in Microsoft, Havas, you name it. I just never gave one size fits all advice and I could never scale that until now. Now I, I found a way to scale it. Um, and one thing that I learned from all these 10 years of mentoring is that, you know, bespoke, bespoke advice is a key. Um, and how, so how does the way work? First, we try and understand you. We not only ask questions about how do you know professionally, but also your learning style and even your identity, because guess what? That does count when it comes to like putting together a learning plan for you. And then what we deliver is not only um, a personalized learning plan for the year for your career and your professional development, but also we put you in touch with peers, which are other people that are on the same journey as you. And we also um, put you in touch with like advocates, people that are gonna, people like creative people or creative leaders that are gonna help you on your career. So um, we are the only people who have this three-way personalization from all the L&D competitors out there. There is a full extensive competitor research at the back of this. Um, and why people are liking it, individuals are liking it because it's kind of a mix of like, it's very industry, it's an industry specific and identity specific learning, which gives them like, because the learning is very targeted, nobody forgets everything, which is a problem with one size fits all and then L and D. And for companies, uh, what is interesting is it's kind of a combination of learning and development for retention with diversity and inclusion, because you know, they get smarter recruitment, better um, diversity retention, and sometimes much needed PR. Um, how do we know all this? Well, I am also the co-founder of She Says, is we've been uh, listening globally to 70,000 women about their challenges, uh, specifically to the creative industries, but this can scale to other industries because the challenges are the same. So we created bespoke content. This is our unfair advantage, actually, that only, well, that only we have. Um, we not only have targeted learning, but we also have content that what people are telling us, which no one else has when it comes to their challenges. And um, the professional LNG market is set to grow. Um, the interesting thing is how high the, the tagger is. But uh, another thing that I wanted to point out is like uh, employees are paying for, for learning and development um, for it so that they can retain employees. And usually they pay $1,300 and we can cut that in half because um, for, for enterprise customers, we are going to charge about 550 pounds per person per year. Uh, for individual customers, it's much less because it's about £100 per person per year or £10 a month. Um, there are other revenue streams like add-on um, sessions with coaches, about £70. So our attraction to date, um, 
uh, we raised a little bit through crowdfunding to build the MVP, and we want to raise another 250K to build a couple of um, features for the platform. Uh, we are doing due diligence with CFS, C, SFC Capital and also in talks with um, an investor club in, uh, in the US. Um, and what we want uh, the money for is basically to boost up the enterprise features because we want to target B2B, which is basically where the money is. <laughs> um, but also we need to kind of build a couple of functionality for, for users. And um, the team is great that we have, um, you know, we both me and James built products for ventures before. Now we want to do it for ourselves. And I think most importantly, our crew and our team represents the audience that we are after. We are super passionate about closing the opportunity gap um, and help companies make money, um, by, but also have social impact. So that's us. And I hope I was under three minutes. Would love some feedback. And I don't know if you invest in ed tech or voc tech, but if so, I'd love to talk further. Um, you want to take yourself off screen share just so that we can uh, okay. see both your faces. Awesome, cool. thanks. Um, so I would say, um, I would um, reshape your story to mm -hmm. start with um, what I thought was really interesting, what you said um, around what you were doing, the one-to-one -one coaching yeah. um, that you were doing at you know, Microsoft or, or was it? Um, and the fact that you're part of um, She Says as well. Uh, yeah. So I think um, I would start with that story originally saying, um, you know, I... Um, spend the last 10 years uh, mentoring um, women right. one-to-one -one, and I realized I never gave the same advice twice you know advice needs to be um, needs to be personalizable um, but the reality is in companies that's not what happens and the right. and platforms are not um, are not fit for purpose and so when you you you're taking the investor on that journey where they see that there is personal personal experience and they can definitely relate to that because, you know, who hasn't, you know, helped someone one-to-one -one in their company or something. So you can uh, instantly relate to it. And then, um, and then you take them through what you've seen the, the problem is um, within the LNG platforms and then what the solution that you're bringing. So if you reshape it, with that um, timeline, I think um, it will work really well. Um, right. Something to note, and that's for everyone here and all of us when we are um, when we are very constrained by time, we try to go like really fast. Uh -huh. <laughs> Remember that you're you're talking to someone who is human as well. So just like take also your time to to breathe and to um uh, and to sometimes you know pose in in places that are really important um because if you're going too quickly and if you're also i mean i know that it's stressful to do these exercises um that's why you need to repeat it as many times as you like it has to become such muscle memory that you could say it in your sleep basically but mm. <laughs> if you're going too fast then um the person in front of you might start being stressed themselves you know so just, <laughs> you know like take a deep breath this is okay like you know um the audience is there to learn from you actually you are presenting something that is valuable and as long as you believe that then actually the people in front will also believe it. So, uh, but that's, that's, I think, advice for everyone when we're doing speaking opportunities. No, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. And uh, I don't know, does Alma do a lot um, ed tech? Um, they are, I've definitely seen some people um, interested in ed tech before um, in the group. Um, I mean, it's, what, that's what's interesting about the communities that because there are a lot of different profiles, um, people have, like really, a, a, there's been a lot of things that we've invested in over the last three years. I think in total, we've invested over four million um, to all together. Um, but yeah. Cool. I know there's a lot of people that have their hand raised. We've only got time for one more. Um, as Rox mentioned, we'll we'll send over the link so that if people want to submit their pitch deck, then you can do uh, to the AMA community. So next up, just in chronological order, is Karina. Great, thank you very much. I'll share my screen if that's all right. I'll keep it as short as I can. <laughs> Can 
let me know if you can see my screen. She was loading. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Okay, excellent. There's a villain among us, a real threat, making children as young as two anxious and depressed. But we'd like to tell you a story of how we're on the way to making 1 million in revenue next year with current 25% month on month revenue growth fighting this villain. And the villain is the screen. There is a NASA test to spot creative genius, and it's showing that 98% of toddlers pass, but only 2% of adults do. So what are we doing to our children? 5.9 million children in the UK are being looked after by a nanny or babysitter every single week, and each and every one of these is an opportunity for creativity. But in recent decades, children have been spending hours parked in front of screens, until one day a musician and an actor began bringing their creativity into their childcare jobs as part-time nannies. We realized we could sing, dance, and use our imagination to create exciting worlds. Why would we let our children stare mindlessly at screens any longer? Thus, Kokoria was born. We bring creatives with spare time, musicians, actors, dancers, into the childcare industry and turn babysitting into the most creative time of day. We're solving three problems in one. The first one is increasingly stressed children in the digital age. The second one is the lack of quality flexible childcare, despite the changing working patterns. And the third one is the growing underemployed talent pool of creatives, especially since COVID, who are leaving the creative industries. So our creatives use the four elements of Kokorio, music, movement, art, and languages, with imagination and everyday objects for a sustainable approach, nurturing children's emotional development. Our creatives love working part-time, um, and flexibly, and Kokori enables them to continue pursuing their creative careers that in turn offer everyone entertainment. And we operate as a recruitment and booking agency and take a percentage of each transaction. Families love us. We have 1,300 customers and 300 creatives on our book and have generated over £200,000 in revenue to date, proving our concept. We have an 85% repeat customer rate and we're growing month on month by 25% on average. This week alone, Kokorio is sending over 40 creatives into London-based families to bring a spark of joy to over 60 children. Kokorio is designed by creatives for creatives. Our young and ambitious founding team is supported by experienced senior members of the team and also mentors and advisors. We're building a mobile app which will allow us to scale, reducing customer conversion time by 50%, helping retaining talent and increasing safety. We will support millions of families around the world with our learning journey, offering a tailored service to each and every one of them, thanks to our creatives' diverse skills. We're raising £340,000, and this would allow us to start scaling as soon as tomorrow. Our app is almost ready. Help us raise the happier adults of tomorrow in a more creative world. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, that's a really, um, really cool idea. I like it. Um, so it's something that I saw on your last slide. Um, make sure everyone that you add, if you have EIS or SEIS um, on your deck, or when you're reaching out to investors, that's, that's quite important because it's very useful in the UK. Um, I mean, in general, um, I like the story. Um, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's clearly an interesting idea. Um, just at the beginning, um, you switch from um, explaining how kids are very stressed to saying that you're going to make like 1 million in revenue. And it sounds like you're making that revenue on the back of children being stressed. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just in the way that it's phrased. I would just rephrase that. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, the deck is, is very clear. Um, there is not too much um, text, which... I was able to, you know, stay focused on what you were saying. Um, so um, generally speaking, yeah, I think, and, and I think you stayed within the, the three minutes. So um, yeah, really um, good job. Amazing, thank you. Do you think um, it may be interesting at all to, to send over to Alma, is that sort of thing? Um, so um, there is definitely someone that I, I have in mind um, who, um, works for, uh, is it Vinted or one of his um, platform that, um, yeah. Um, but I wanted to just send on the chat, um, 
this is the link to um, share your deal with Alma. Um, what I would say is only um, send it when you're ready, when you know that you're ready to pitch. Um, and then once it's sent, um, the way that it works is that it goes through like a very small screening where basically um, the, um, the founding team of Alma just checks that you're a female founder. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many men actually apply. Um, it's, um, so, and then it gets posted on, on we have a, a Slack um, channel. Um, and then, it, um, so if you put my name as, as referral, then um, they will tag me in it. And then I can, um, I can just mention that, you know, you were part of the Hotbed um, program um, and um, yeah, that I can make the introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no worries. Thank you so much for your time today and providing that feedback and also the insights at the beginning. Um, we'll say goodbye because you probably have to get off to a million other things to do. So thank you. For <laughs> no um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, for Roxanne. Um, that's it for today. So we will see you on Thursday. Um, we actually don't have a peer to peer session this week. We've got two sessions on Thursday, so 2pm and 3pm. We'll follow up via WhatsApp with all the details of those sessions as well. As always, if you've got any specific questions that you want to ask, Em and myself will stick around for a minute or two now. Otherwise, you're free to log off. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, Roxanne.